I'm Nina Barrett, author of The Leopold and Loeb Files, and you're watching Author's Voice. Welcome to Author's Voice, connecting authors to the world. Our show today is Stranger Than Fiction, and I'm your host, Daniel Weinberg, and we're embedded in the broadcast studio we have at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. We're celebrating our 85th year in business, actually. So uh, if you haven't been there at the inception, come in today. If you're watching on Facebook Live or on our website, use the comments button to ask a question, submit one while we're live, and give us your name and where you're from so we can say hello and thank you as well. But most importantly, if you want to order a signed book or seven, you can get them right now. Uh, just go to authorsvoice.net and you can get your copy sent to you, signed first edition to add to your library. So today we're very happy to have a Chicago author and a colleague in the book business, Nina Barrett. She owns the book ends and Beginnings in Evanston, Illinois. I think you should all go to it. It's a wonderful bookshop. She's the author of a number of other books, including The Playgroup, Renegade Heart, Voices in the Forest, and Deering Library, an Illustrated History. I think Frank Lloyd Wright, didn't he say that that was a pig on his back? He did say that. He did say that. So uh, I, ha I have to interrupt here with one little aside, which is there's another Nina Barrett. No, did I put the wrong ones? Some of those books. Oh, so I'm so you, sorry. I really made a mistake. The Renegade Heart. I mean, if you see any of the ones with cleavage, that's yeah, not me. That's not you. Okay. Sorry about <laughs> that, everybody. Anyway, today's book is written by Nina Barrett. And uh, she had numerous articles, essays, and reviews. Uh, her book, her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, The Nation, and elsewhere. She curated the Northwestern University exhibit. The Murder That Would Not Die, that inspired today's book. We'll get to that, too. Her latest book is The Leopold and Loeb Files, an intimate look at one of America's most infamous crimes. It's a Midway Press, an agate imprint book, 296 pages, profusely illustrated, and one of the reasons to obtain this book, actually, is $35. And I think you're going to enjoy having this book and sharing it with others as well. It's just too much fun. Even though you think you know something about, about Leopold and Loeb, you really don't. This book will tell you more. I want to begin, first of all, are you related to the famed Oliver Barrett, who was in Winnetka and was a gigantic collector of Lincolniana? I have actually, the, the only real artifact I can show here is his uh, auction catalog of all of his books and autographs and lithographs and everything else. Are you uh, related at all? So I'm not, I'm not related to him. And I thought you meant the Al Oliver Barrett who was in Love Story. That's the, old, the Oliver Barrett people always ask me about. Oh, really? Yes. No, this is <laughs> Oliver Barrett had a Lincoln collection. I did not know. And interestingly know. enough, this particular uh, copy, which is mine, uh -huh. has a name in it, which I will not show, but I will say who it is, Mike Leopold. Oh, wow. And he bought numbers of things. He had a huge collection of Americana. Mm -hmm. And he bought numbers of things out of this auction catalog. Very interesting. So um, I want to say that, in interestingly, I'm going to show another book real fast mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's the same sort of book. We had Dan Abrams uh, in for his book on Lincoln's last trial. And this is the second book in you know, a few months where the trial testimony, which had been hidden for many years, uh, became the main character in a new narrative history, just like mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most fascinating parts about your book, how the testimony is the driving force, I think, uh, besides the uh, Talmudic uh, passages on the in the, on the side that tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly to say this, because I can, uh, you said that during the exhibit, mm -hmm. that was at Northwestern that you curated, 
many people came up claiming some connection mm -hmm. to the case. And the ALBS, our bookshop, and I myself have a number of connections as well. We're going to talk about some of them. Ralph Newman, who began my shop, mm -hmm. was a book dealer for Leopold while he was in prison. He found his attorney, mm -hmm. Elmer Gertz, because Elmer Gertz had helped him found the, the Civil War Roundtable and mm -hmm. the whole Civil War Roundtable movement. He was also the literary agent for Leopold's book, as we'll talk about. Picked him up at the airport when Leopold came to Chicago. Carl Sandburg is mentioned quickly in your book. Mm -hmm. And he not only inspired our, books, our shop specialty, mm -hmm. but our logo came from him. Elmer Gertz was married to my mom's second cousin and his first, <laughs> first wow. wife. Wow. Uh, and um, let's see, what else? Also founder of the State of the Round Table. Uh, Leopold's brother, Foreman, mm -hmm. known as Mike, was a formidable autograph collector, as I just showed at the Barrett sale. And his wife had the smallest little book plate I've ever seen. Just gorgeous. Leopold's reading glasses I found in here, and the testimony was purchased at 30 North Michigan Avenue in Chicago, where my father's psychiatric office was, mm -hmm. and where my, uh, all my teeth were done as a kid. So I was going there when I was 8, 9, 10. Um, and also, Leopold's dad died on my birthday hmm. some years before. So let's instead of us here, let's mm -hmm. talk about your book. Okay. The files, uh, and this is what the files look like, I think. I'm not sure if this is exactly intimate look. I think you probably put on. Is that correct? Was that so the, later? So the cover is a, sort of a replica of the cover of the Confessions, which does have a couple of these old ripped labels on them. There is one right here. We, Yeah. We altered the... The, the write, writing to you know, have the book title, yeah, but it's yeah, great. it's a replica of the confession. It's great. So the files uh, were at Northwestern. How did they get there? And uh, how were they found? Mm -hmm. So there are two separate collections at Northwestern. One of them is at Archives. One of them is in Special Collections. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the ones that are in the archives, uh, well, first of all, nothing related to this case necessarily would have survived because at, in 1924 there wasn't a court archive. And so generally a lot of stuff just got thrown out at the end of a court case. In this case, because the case was so infamous, even at the time, internationally famous, people who were involved with it in different ways walked off with, <laughs> with the evidence. So, so a lot of it disappeared into private collections and then only resurfaced a lot later. So the collection that's now at Northwestern in archives, um, that's a wonderful story where Kevin Leonard, who is now the head of archives at Northwestern, uh, but was an assistant archivist back in the 80s, and he went down to Northwestern's law school downtown one day to just empty out all these files and boxes and things that had accumulated in the basement over a long period of time. And he spent the whole day going, going through these boxes to decide what needed to be kept and what needed to be you know, not kept. And at the very end of the day, he found a paper bag on the floor. And he um, has that morbid fear of spiders. And he thought, did he really want to unroll the top of that paper bag? Because he was thinking about how long had that bag been sitting there on the floor and what might be inside it. And he then his curiosity overcame him, and he reached inside. And the first thing that he pulled out was a note that said, Dear sir, you no doubt know by now your son has been kidnapped. Mm. And that was creepy. But he didn't know what it was. But then he reached his hand in again, and he pulled out uh, an envelope that was addressed to Mr. Jacob Franks. And the minute he saw that name, he knew exactly what that was. So the bag proved to contain not only the original ransom note in the Leopold and Loeb case, it also contained uh, these original copies of the psychiatric reports that Darrow had commissioned, and um, also the 500-page transcript of the interrogations and the confessions of Leopold and Loeb in police cu custody. 
So that's now all in archives, and then there's a whole separate collection that came via Elmer Gertz mm -hmm. later, because Gertz was the attorney who uh, worked with Leopold to get him promote, uh, paroled, and Gertz had wound up um, with the 5,000-page uh, court transcript, which we think had been Darrow's copy, and then had gone to the Leopold family, and then the Leopold family gave it to Gertz to help with the parole effort. Before the exhibit, mm -hmm. because it was put on exhibit some years later, mm -hmm. um, had any of that been used before? It has been used, um, most notably John Logan, who wrote a play called Never the Sinner. Um, he's now a, an Academy Award winning screenwriter um, in LA, but he his first produced um, play was Never the Sinner, and it was based on this collection, which because he was an undergraduate at Northwestern, he had spent a lot of time uh, researching. But And there have been other uh, researchers who've looked at it, yeah. Well, I love the way it's used in this book. I mm -hmm. mean, first of all, in the acknowledgments, acknowledgments you said that by curating that exhibit, mm -hmm. uh, you learn that artifacts can both inform and tell a story, bringing one back to the past and the moment. Of course, mm -hmm. that's what we do in the shop every single day. Uh, it's our stock and trade. So what did you learn about artifacts and how they can be used to tell that story? Um, well, well, that's how you used it in the book. Right, and that was a little lesson that I learned when I did the exhibit. I didn't want it to be the kind of, you know, um, excuse me, art museum kind of exhibit where there's an object in a case and then a label that says 1934 book. <laughs> but I felt like we can tell, it, curiously enough, if you, you can line all these artifacts up in chronological order and begin with the ransom note, which was the, you know, the first piece of paper generated by this case. And then you can proceed through the interrogations to the confessions. Then you can proceed to the psychiatric reports because that's you know what happened in between the confessions and the beginning of the court case where Darrow's psychiatric examinations. And then you have a 5,000 page transcript that documents every single day that they were in court. So Actually, you, these documents can be lined up to chronologically tell the story from beginning to end. And that's what you do in this book. Here is that ransom note that uh, you're, you're mm -hmm. alluding to. And what I love about this, I mean, your book itself to me is an artifact. Mm -hmm. Because it shows artifacts as real objects, not just an image of something. And so it's a great design. How did that evolve? Again, um, yeah, there were, there were sort of a couple of strands. You know, I knew that what I wanted to do was go through and excerpt the documents. It's 10,000 10, pages of documents. So I knew the excerpts needed to be fairly short, and I wanted each excerpt to directly address some kind of issue or question or something that people want to know the answer to about this case. Then I knew they were going to have to be sewed together with some kind of narrative glue, so I added sections that take you um, along the story. And then um, initially I started to do research into the newspapers of the time because I thought that was going to help me with factual information. And what I very quickly found was that there was a lot of fictionalizing going on in the newspaper accounts even at the time. And so that, that element is also in there. It's a third element on the pages. But it's, it turned out to be more of a color commentary thing than a fact. I don't want to say these are sound bites, but yeah. they really are those many, many chapters. You have 50 plus chapters in mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And they just go quickly. You want to get to the next one to see what the next part of the case is, actually. Mm -hmm. It does bring you along. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to a little bit of the beginning. We're not going to have to tell everything about Leopold and Loeb. Many people know the story, I think. But how did they gravitate to each other uh, prior to the murder? How do they get to know each other? They certainly lived on the same block. They didn't live literally on the same block. Um, they lived about four blocks away from each other in Hyde Park. Mm. They, were they met as students at the University of Chicago. They were both very precocious. They were a couple of years ahead of themselves academically at school. 
and they struck up a friendship, um, which fairly quickly, I think, went, um, what, what would be the word, dark. <laughs> um, there's a whole history of crimes, little petty crimes they started committing together, and it seems like they were really egging each other on to do that. Um, and uh, well, They also had a, a major spat at one time, which is an interesting thing that came out. Uh, and there's a chapter called For Robert's Sake. And that, for Robert's sake, and this compact that they had mm -hmm. saved their friendship. Uh, unfortunately, maybe for both of them, because maybe this crime wouldn't have happened if they didn't come together, but nonetheless. Um, so tell us about that compact. Uh, and also, I know that there was an alleged sexual side mm -hmm. of this friendship. Um, and so that, that's certainly what the state's attorney later went out, and I, the only time I think I can use this phrase on author's voice is that the attorney general call, the attorney, state attorney called it cunnilingualism. So what was their, their relationship that led to the spat? Um, so they did have a sexual relationship, and I think um, you, people are often ask me, were, is it true that they were lovers? And I think that that's a sort of romantic term for what they were. My impression, there's quite a bit of, um, you know, uh, there's quite a bit about that in the psychiatric reports and in their, you know, confessions. So it's, I don't think it's a, um, it's in question that they had the sexual relationship. And in fact, this pact that you're referring to has um, essentially states that Leopold will go along with these petty crimes that Loeb wants to commit in return for sexual favors, essentially. Um, and the pact was set to expire uh, on a certain day in June when Leopold had a ticket to leave for Europe on the Mauritania. And this is 1924. This is 1924. And he said later that he, um, they had been planning the murder and planning the murder and planning the murder, and he th thought that if he kept stalling long enough to just get on the boat, he'd be able to get away without committing the crime. But Loeb was pushing him really hard. We're going to get to that. Who was pushing whom, and is that the case? And was Leopold later saying, she was trying to get away from it, but mm -hmm. he was still embedded in that mm -hmm. crime. Uh, so tell us very briefly, mm -hmm. Because you have to go into the book if you yeah, really want absolutely. to get all the intimate details of the murder. Uh, but the murder of 14-year-old Bobby Franks, mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. literally down the street, mm -hmm. yes. and was known by both of them. Yes. Quickly give us a synopsis of what happened. So they, well, Leopold and Loeb planned this kidnapping slash murder, um, knowing from the beginning that they were going to kill their victim immediately because they wanted to try to extract a $10,000 ransom from a rich father, but they didn't want to be identified afterward by their victim. Was that their major motive? Um, well, their, money? their major motive was to, to, do, to pull off the perfect crime. I mean, they, didn't, they obviously did not need the money. Um, but they really had this idea that they were smarter than everybody else and that they would prove it by by doing this crime, which no one would ever find out about. And um, so they selected Bobby pretty much at random. They were, they were stalking a group of kids who went to the local prep school uh, that day. And they stalked other kids, but Bobby was the only one they caught by himself. And yeah, he was 14 years old. He went to walk three blocks from the baseball game that he was playing to his home. Um, Loeb. He and Loeb were second cousins, so he knew Loeb. And Loeb and Leopold pulled up in a car, and Loeb invited him to get into the car. And even though he didn't want to ride, he did. And they killed him in the car. And then they went, drove down to a, a swamp near the Indiana border. They dumped his body there. They poured acid on it. They thought it would never be identified. They thought it would decompose, and no one would ever find it. And unfortunately for them, it was found first thing the next morning, and the whole thing unraveled. Oh. Uh, I mean, they were very cool after this when they were, when it came out, and they weren't especially yet the main suspects, but they were being brought in because they were involved to some extent. And um, I mean, they were making phone calls, they were eating right afterward, they were making a date, um, and. Uh, 
actually staying close to the investigation, listening to their parents read about it from the newspapers and commenting on it. They were very cool. Well, cool is one word you could use. Uh, you know, what they didn't have, clearly either one of them was any empathy. And so they were somehow able to be in this very tight, small community of people who all knew each other and all knew the Franks family. And um, yeah, Loeb at one point was standing in the sidewalk in front of his own house, half a block away from the Franks house, watching Frank's body being brought out in a casket by a bunch of 14-year-old pallbearers. And he said that kind of, you know, tickled him, that no one knew that he was the murderer and he was standing there watching this. So a quick synopsis of what, you know, the evidence, what mm -hmm. tipped the police off. Certainly the glasses were found mm -hmm. near the body, mm -hmm. which is kind of fascinating, especially because later in the trial they tried to recreate it him having the glasses fall out of his pocket, and it didn't happen in the, right. in the trial. It happened only at the murder site. Uh, a typewriter that was used, mm -hmm. and their alibi packed. Mm -hmm. That kind of came apart right. because they were kept apart and didn't know what the other was saying. Is that the main evidence that went up against him? Well, also the ransom note itself turned out to be uh, something that, from the very beginning, the police knew that they were dealing with some newfangled kind of kidnapper because the ransom note was so well written that they knew that whoever had written it had had was a very educated man, as they said. And um, so they were first, they started looking at the teachers at the school, thinking that they you know, could write that well and would maybe have uh, a motive. But um, ultimately, there were two reporters who um, helped break the case, later won the Pulitzer Prize for journalism, not only for reporting on the case, but for helping to solve it. This? And these were, this was uh, uh, Mulroy and Goldstein, okay. who were fellow students of Loeb's at the University of Chicago, and they heard that uh, Leopold had a study group that met in his house, and he would type the notes up for the study group. So they went and got copies of the notes, took them to the typewriter expert, and lo and behold, the, the type on the notes exactly matched the type on the ransom note. So how did, the, how did this intellectualism mm -hmm. play out, not only for the investigators, but also for the public? What was the public perception of intellects? Uh, of their intellects? Of intellects in general. Yeah. Well, I mean, what you see in the press coverage at the time is this sort of mixed fascination. Um, some of the reporters referred to uh, perhaps this was a symptom of jasmania and this new type of um, privileged student who got sent to a place like the University of Chicago and um, got carried away with her own intellectualism and drank gin and drove around with loose girls in cars. And it was sort of like, what is the world coming to now when we're, we're educating this elite uh, group of students who are super smart but don't seem to have the moral, um, you know, they don't go to church, they are not, in, in this case, because they were both Jewish, they hadn't been brought up in a traditionally Jewish way. Um, was, was this whole crime somehow a symptom of the 20s and, and, and the whole country kind of losing its mind, really? Uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm going to, since you brought it up, mm. uh, I'm going to ask you about the Jewish angle, mm -hmm. uh, because then the age-old question must have arisen, is it good for the Jews? But <laughs> Mayor Levin, mm -hmm. uh, who was a Leopold friend and later, later wrote Compulsion, yes. both the book and then yeah. came a movie, said that there was a secret admiration for the boy's brilliance mm -hmm. inside the Jewish community, even for, maybe especially for such a horrendous crime. Look how brilliant they were in <laughs> trying to do it. we overachieved again. Again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what was the Jewish community's reaction? To me, it would have been the Yiddish word, it's a shanda, mm -hmm. you know, meaning a scandalous, shameful disgrace, mm -hmm. especially before the non-Jewish people. Sure, sure. And, and Meyer Levin also wrote that there was some relief that the victim was also Jewish because the Jewish community felt that if it had been two Jewish boys murdering a Gentile, mm -hmm. There would have been, I mean, as it was, there was a cross burning in Hyde Park. You know, the Klan was out. Um, 
And I think there was a great fear in the Jewish community that there would be some huge backlash. Um, and there was some, again, like the Jewish leaders were also saying that it was a problem that these kids had not been raised in a good moral Jewish environment. Um, I, my sense is it wasn't, you know, it wasn't widely reported as a Jewish crime. It, that was one more angle. I just want to show very quickly an artifact that you have in here because mm -hmm. it has a, a postal connection here to Chicago. Yes. Some postal history was made. Matt, if you want to put the envelope up, because uh, it was the first four-bar cancellation. So this is actually a postal history as well as a piece of evidence. Yes. So that was a little uh, very um, funny little thing that I noticed that the, you know, the postmark on this incredibly iconic uh, envelope that there's is pictured almost always in the story of this crime the postmark is clearly wrong on the front and um, I went to a postal expert to try to determine why that would be and it he, he looked at this envelope and he said well there you see those four bars across the stamps that's called the four bar cancel previously the first use of this cancel in Chicago postal history was a week later than this and so he said a now this envelope is the first documented use. And B, he thought it was just like a new stamp that the postal clerk hadn't learned how to operate yet, and he hadn't changed the date. Let's get to the interrogations sure. and the confessions. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they tell of their personalities and of their friendship during that tense period when they were both going through that interrogation mm -hmm. by, the, by the police? Mm -hmm. Well, they tried very hard to they had made, uh, they had pre-made an arrangement that they did have an alibi, but they were only going to use it if arrested within a week of having committed the crime. So unfortunately for them, again, they calculated the week differently. So one of them was measuring from the actual day of the murder, and one of them was m measuring from the day after, because that's when they had actually abandoned the whole rest of the plot. So. Um, so it, it begins with them not using the alibi, with Leopold just you know, pretending he doesn't remember what happened and on the day of the murder. And what you see, I mean, the interrogations are just fascinating to me because there's just this uh, dialogue of 1920s crime, you know, the kinds of questions that the detectives are asking, and you can almost hear the tone that they're asking them in. And Leopold is, is, he's just this arrogant teenage boy who's really convinced that he can outwit them. And you, it, that comes through in the dialogue, and it's also how the press were treating them. You know, that's how they were writing about it. And, um, but you, you also, once uh, Leopold started to use the alibi, that was part of what unraveled the crime. And you also see that happening in the dialogue. You can see Leopold getting more and more anxious um, as the noose kind of tightens around his neck. It was not a day, a time of the Miranda rights right. being given. Right. Why didn't they get legal counsel earlier? Their parents, if nothing else, why didn't they get someone to represent them immediately? Because their parents were so sure that this was so ridiculous that they, they both made statements to the press saying, of course, this is, this is just utterly ridiculous. Of course, it will clear itself up, and our sons should just cooperate. I mean, everyone thought it was ridiculous. So um, yeah, so that, that backfired on them, because by the time um, there was a confession, and then they tried to get uh, legal counsel in there, by that point, the state's attorney was just determined to do everything he needed to do to create, as he called it, a hanging case. Yeah, that's, that's positive. That's what he wanted to do. Let's talk about the diagnosis of insanity, because and, mm. and and, that was really um, a major part of the case. Uh, and the initial psychiatric report diagnosed them as insane. But this didn't really go into the trial, and as you say, this is new evidence that's actually in your book now uh, you're, you're mentioning. They're carbon copies and uh, handled by a dealer later on and that uh, went into the collection finally. Uh, 
And the report said that they knew right from wrong but could not modify their conduct. So they were really putting it onto a medical condition that they had. Uh, that's what went into the trial. But why didn't the insanity make it into the trial? The initial diagnosis. Well, so I think there's a difference between what we, what you and I would call insanity and then what their, the legal definition of insanity that you need to use an insanity defense. So I think that most people would assume just um, by nature of the crime they had committed, of course they were insane because who can do that? But um, yes, there has to be, legally there has to be this knowledge of right and wrong and the ability to refrain from doing something that's wrong. Um, Darrow initially was planning to use an insanity defense. He thought the best possible outcome would be for them to be declared insane and committed to an insane asylum for the rest of their lives. At some point, he decided that uh, because a jury was going to be required in order for an insanity defense to be used, and the popular opinion was so outraged by this, he, he thought, Actually, he was very unlikely to make that work, and the best strategy would be to just plead them guilty and sane, and then have their sentencing be on the shoulders of a single judge who hopefully would be somewhat enlightened and would not want to have their death on his shoulders by himself. Yeah. So this whole question, so what happened was he, his psychiatrist produced for the record a report that confirmed that they were sane. There was a suggestion at the time, the state's attorney said at one point in the, at the trial, isn't it true that initially your own psychiatrist found them to be insane? And they all denied that. So what has surfaced again now is an initial psychiatric report, probably the original one, in which they were found to be insane. Doing this for their client, of course. The Darrow and Darrow being that, they wanted to do what Darrow wanted them to do. The psychiatrist yes. did, yes. And so apparently what they did was they found the kids insane first, and then when Darrow changed his strategy, they this other this first report was lost, and then another report in its place um, found them to be sane. So we, we haven't had the evidence all this time that Darrow did um, sort of tamper with his own evidence, but it appears now that he did. He did. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to show an interesting photograph that appears here uh, of uh, an x-ray looking at a skull. And are they looking for insanity inside this x-ray of the skull? Well, Darrow... What was this about? I mean, he really had them examined medically, physically, as well as psychologically. Um, there was a great deal of discussion about their, the hormones, the, their pituitaries, the, you know, what, what were these mysterious chemicals inside a human body. He was really looking for, um, I think both for strategic reasons, but also because I really think Darrow did believe that, that there are causes for why people act the way they act. And I, I think it was a fairly exciting period in medical science when you know he thought maybe maybe we'll isolate the hormone that made these people so abnormal that they could do something that just is unimaginable well i'm going to ask about that if, uh you know glands, glands. like a thyroid for right. instance and right. other glands inside the body did darrow really think that two simultaneously malfunctioning glands in these two boys could prove them insane enough to get by? Well, I think like a good attorney, he was trying every avenue he could try. Um, and as I said, I also do think that he really was intellectually um, curious about what caused evil, and maybe he thought there was an answer here. And then there was a third thing, which was he really used these ex the examinations and the psychiatric reports, which he, by the way, leaked to the whole press. So all of this intimate, excruciating detail about what their first words were and how much they weighed and you know what their nannies were like was widely published in the papers at the time. And what he was really trying to do was humanize them 
And you know, they're, they're, the, the caricatures of them that were being drawn by the reporters were that they were these sort of two evil geniuses enmeshed in you know, a sort of Nietzschean black whatever. And he really, I think, saw the psychiatric reports as a way of saying, hey, you know, they're, they're, they're kids, they're, you know, they're people, we don't know what goes on inside people, we don't know what motivates them. It's our duty as a society to probe that question, not to just throw them out because of what they've done. Yeah, the, uh, the Nietzschean part was interesting that uh, they didn't have the normal human feelings of empathy that came out of studying Nietzsche. And later at the parole hearings, Leopold had to defend himself that he's no longer a Nietzschean or if he ever was. Uh, let's, let's go to a couple of the people who are involved, others than, that are usually known. Uh, the judge, Judge Caverly. Uh, please give us a brief synopsis of whom he was. Um, well, he you have an image of him. Okay, um, he, I mean, he was the the ju chief judge of the criminal courts. Um, he was, I think, probably. Um, well, there's some dispute about this. I actually, there's something kind of interesting that surfaced recently with uh, David Mamet, um, his recent novel Chicago where um, he, in the final chapter, he makes this, he, he, have you read this? Okay. So the final chapter of the book, he comes up with this um, new theory about the Leopold and Loeb case that says that Darrow actually went and bribed the judge in order to, yeah. you know, yeah. prevent the execution. That's in your book. Yeah. Um, the, and, and there was, um, you know, Leopold himself said at one point, made a claim that his family would pay off the judge and that's how he would get off. Um, the judge, Caverly had a, a very strong outburst at the end, at the very end of the trial where he felt that that issue was raised and someone was accusing him of being a friendly judge and he In almost, the summation. yeah, yeah. State's attorney's it, summation. So there was a very strong rebuke of the state's attorney. Um, I, my impression um, is that he he really the one question one open question is why did he allow once um, Darrow had pled guilty why did he allow days and days and days of testimony from every single witness associated with this case from all the psychiatrists um, into the record when it wasn't strictly necessary. I mean, I feel from reading what he wrote about it that he also felt that we should try to understand. If there's, if there's any kind of an explanation for why, you know, two such well-educated, supposedly brilliant men with their whole future ahead of them would throw it all away to do something like this, something that showed so little, um, you know, awareness of, of anyone else's feelings or anything, then you know maybe we should use the trial, use this whole um, moment as an opportunity to try to understand it. I think that he, um, I think he was on the up and up. I think he listened to all the evidence and he made a call, you know, based based on law and not based on his own emotions. There's a picture we have of the judge walking into the court with Leopold and Loeb. Mm -hmm. So if you want to pin maybe they had the judge in their pockets, I'm really surprised to see that sort of a photograph extant, let alone his going in with them. Yeah, so I believe that that picture actually, what it is, is they're going out into the courtyard to take, I believe that's the murder car. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they are going out into the courtyard accompanied by other people um, to take a look at the car. Oh, so, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Now, the summation, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but mm -hmm. we're going to go back and forth. Okay. And the summation that Darrow had uh, was this plea that he did that was published and widely disseminated. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, was, it was a plea really for humanity and for understanding that uh, hanging is not the solution and will not stop other murders going on. I think we have a, a photograph of the pamphlet 
to show. This is just one of those that was uh, handed around. So it's really a, an appeal for humanity in the face of evil, mm -hmm. no? And maybe the judge heard that and was a bit swayed by that as well? Um, well, I mean, when the judge finally made his pronouncement, what he said was, basically, we don't execute teenagers in the state of Illinois. And thank you, Mr. Darrow, for all those, you know, days and days and days of, of trying to understand them. And, you know, but he said, I'm pretty sure that if you look into the life and mind of any murderer, you're going to find stuff, yeah. you know. So that doesn't, um, that doesn't mitigate. Um, he, he just said, we're, we're not going to execute them because that's not what we do here. And that, that was a pretty um, progressive stance even for the day because I think um, Crow, the attorney, the state's attorney, when he had been in the same position in the criminal courts, he had executed. And he wanted them to be executed. So, um, you know, whether, whether Darrow impressed the judge, I think he did impress um, his audience. And, um, you know, that's often what he was trying to do, was play to a larger audience and not necessarily play by the existing rules. He really wanted to change some of the rules. Yeah, and that plea, I think, got mm -hmm. out widely and maybe helped mm -hmm. just do that in society. Um, I love his use of poetry. Mm -hmm. There were three or four times that he just yeah. put poetry in the <laughs> middle of his yes. summation. He's a very, I just saw him as a very Shakespearean character. And, uh, you know, another thing from re just reading these materials, you're reading the court transcript, and when, when Darrow walks on stage, it's just like Laurence Olivier, you know, has come among the, the lesser actors. It's just the quality of his rhetoric. Is, it's so brilliant. It's so different from how everybody else sounds. You know, he really had this incredible persuasive ability. It came out in the Scopes trial as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's what Darrow is and why he's admired yeah, even today. Absolutely. Now, it was interesting. Uh, Clarence Darrow and Elmer Gertz. Mm -hmm. Elmer Gertz we haven't gotten to, but that's during the parole time. We'll right. talk about that in a few moments. But I was kind of struck by this, that uh, here we have Michael Avenatti, Stormy Daniels' attorney, certainly a savvy media person. Mm -hmm. Here in the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, Mr. Lincoln was fairly savvy mm. with the media mm -hmm. during his time. Mm -hmm. So both Darrow and Gertz, how savvy were they for the media? How aware were they that they, had, they could have an impact into how the public viewed uh, what, what they wanted them to view? What was their relationship with the press? Mm -hmm. Well, Darrow, as I say, leaked these psychiatric reports. So um, that was a, a very savvy move. Um, Gertz, uh, one thing you see in um, that collection, which includes many, many drafts of statements he made to the parole boards at various times, and you see Gertz's comments on them. And one thing that really struck me is, you know, in the first place, how how much trouble Leopold was having all those years later, 35 years later, just formulating something that sounded like a genuinely remorseful statement. And you see Gertz in, you know, with pencil, like suggesting sentences that he might add or phrases that he might add to sound remorseful. I mean, he, Gertz was coaching him very heavily in what, what does remorse sound like? So I think that was very, you know, both media savvy and, uh, you know, I mean, it, it worked with the parole board eventually. There are numbers of things in the trial we haven't gotten to, the governesses mm -hmm. and nurses mm -hmm. and what were their roles and mm -hmm. the roles of mothers and so many different things came out. Um, but I'd like to get into the prison years. Mm -hmm. Now, Loeb, of course, uh, many will know that Loeb was murdered a little over 11 years after uh, being confined in prison. Mm -hmm. First of all, what was the relationship of the two of them while they were in Statesville, uh, in prison, after they had gone through the trial and they were not hanged, which could have happened, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. What was their relationship uh, together there and before Loeb, of course, was murdered? 
Well, they were actually allowed to spend a lot of time together, surprisingly, I think. I mean, they weren't cellmates, but they did spend a lot of time together. They worked on a number of sort of prison, prison initiatives together, including like a little school and a little library. Um, they were, of course, I think trying to prove that they were being rehabilitated. Um, but they, they enjoyed each other's company. Um, the, when Loeb was murdered, eventually, um, and he was basically slashed to death by a fellow prisoner. He died, you know, he bled to death in the prison infirmary, and Leopold was with him to the end. And what was the effect on Leopold afterward in the days and years after that murder? Um, I don't know that I can speak directly to that question, but I do know that Leopold told the parole board. Um, Somebody on the parole board said, you know, what are your feelings about Loeb now? And Leopold told him, well, you might think he ruined my life. <laughs> and he did, sort of. But he was the best pal I ever had. He said, you, you know, I know a lot of people think that he was just evil, but he had this really great side and a charming side. And he was my best pal. This is what he was saying. And also then said, and also my best enemy. And my best enemy. Yeah, if you talk about frenemies, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, late in life, um, people who visited him in his apartment in Puerto Rico said he still had a photograph of Loeb there. Hmm. So it was a real lifelong devotion on his part. You know, I know that they, they were trying to rehabilitate themselves and show that they were. Uh, at the same time, they were two intellectual kids and grew up into the, mm -hmm. whatever manhood they, one of them had and the other one not so much. Um, so it's not surprising to me that they wanted to keep their minds going and that they were going to be there for life as long as they knew. So let's make a use of what mm -hmm. we're interested in. Yeah. And so well, it was really seen at the end that Leopold had rehabilitated himself. Uh, Adlai Stevenson commuted it down to 85 years from uh, life in 99, and uh, William Stratton let the parole go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that Leopold's rehabilitation is, it's a sort of an open question. I mean, I think that they did feel safe that if they let him out, he wasn't going to go kidnap and murder another 14-year-old boy. I mean, it, that was a kind of a once-in-a-lifetime stupid thing to do. Um, in term, But in terms, though, of how remorseful was he ever? I think that's a completely open question, whether he really ever, because if you read his memoir, one, one of the things I think is, is really interesting, if you look at the reviews of Meyer Levin's Compulsion mm -hmm. versus the reviews of Life Plus 99 Years, which was Leopold's memoir, the reviewers said, if you want any insight into Leopold's mind, read the novel, because Maya Levin was like really doing a deep dive into what kind of psychology would have driven somebody to do something like this. Leopold did not want to go there. And he didn't go there in that book. And he doesn't, I mean, I've looked at all this correspondence between him and Gertz that went on for the rest of his life. He doesn't go there either. He really had a lot of trouble understanding that he had not only murdered a boy, but wrecked all three families' lives, and I think inflicted this sort of psychic wound that in Chicago we still seem to feel because this case is still really alive here. Oh, yeah. 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 I think yeah. people are going to be very interested in a book that uh, I would suggest, especially if you're in Chicago anywhere, if you're interested in crime and motivations, this book will get into it very heavily in, in some detail. And, as I say, that transcript is the main character. You just go right mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. this book with all the files that you were able to find. Uh, of course, the, the press, we talked briefly about them, but how was the press at the time? And how did the press deal with him after he was paroled, trying to show rehabilitation, and wanted to be paroled, even during the parole? Had the press changed a great deal by then in their view of him? Um, well, the press, I mean, in 1924, the press 
could, I think, be described as a pack of hungry dogs, basically, who really just wanted colorful copy to fill up their newspapers and didn't necessarily draw firm lines between fact and fiction. My favorite reporter is Maureen Watkins, who would later um, write Ch Chicago, the play that became the musical that we all know now, which was based on another um, case that she was covering that summer as a reporter for the Tribune. That, that Chicago was based on a real Chicago crime. But she was also covering the Leopold and Loeb case. And you, when you read her coverage, you know, and she's, she writes about like the interrogation and she describes Leopold as being suave and Caesar-like as he fields the questions from the detectives. And it's, you know, he, he wasn't suave and Caesar-like. He was nervous, he was chain smoking. Behind the scenes, you can see in all of the transcripts that he's sweating bullets. Um, but she's, in, she's creating this character. And that's what a lot of the, uh, reporters were doing. They had amazing access. They, yes, there was to another. To the trial and to the investigations. Yes. I'm, I was amazed that they were right there. There was another reporter who was sneaking um, liquor from the Loeb's bootleg cellar um, to Leopold and Loeb as a cocktail every afternoon in order to get scoops from them to publish in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, later, one of the notable things that happened, part of the reason that Leopold went to Puerto Rico um, is because he and the parole board both agreed that he could not stay in Chicago without being essentially uh, a constant media target and, a, and being hounded. And um, he wanted privacy. He just wanted to be left alone, yeah, really. An essential part of the parole. He must go to and get out of the States. They, yes, yeah. yeah but he, he wanted to, to go. He yeah. wanted to go. He knew he could never resume anything like normal life living in Chicago again. But there was an incident um, when he did make, uh, when he, I think it was after he was actually off parole and he came back to Chicago and he gave what was supposed to be a private interview to the um, group that had helped him, you know, get his job in um, Puerto Rico. And it was a group, you know, a Catholic group of brothers and he gave a what he thought was a private interview which ended up published in the Chicago Tribune and he felt so betrayed by that um, he said he had a void he'd had all these offers to sell his story and he hadn't um, the and he he had avoided you know the media as also part of his parole um, and the fact that a reporter had just gone and published all of this stuff that he thought he was saying privately really hurt him um, and really outraged him. So maybe, maybe things hadn't changed that much. Oh. Uh, we spoke quickly about Compulsion, the book and mm. the movie both. Uh, what were the major films and books that came out over the years since the murder? Oh, well, let us, brief... let us count. Um, you know, there, there's the famous uh, Alfred Hitchcock film, Rope, oh. And that began as a play. Um, Compulsion had a life as a, also a play, a movie, a, a best-selling book. Um, there have been a couple of true crime books. Everybody seems to know the Hal Higdon book um, on Leopold and Loeb. There was a book about 10 years ago by Simon Botts. Um, there have been um, a number of other dramatic things besides uh, John Logan's Never the Sinner. There is, um, there's actually a Leopold and Loeb musical, an off-Broadway off musical called Thrill Me, in which they both sing. Well, Hamilton sang once. Maybe this will well. have a comeback. <laughs> I don't know. What uh, are some of, or any of, the outstanding mysteries still? For example, who struck the fatal blow? I mean, that went back and forth on them, and Leopold was certainly saying that I was influenced by Loeb, and he, I, he brought me in, and he struck the fatal blow. Is there a mystery still about who did that? I don't think there's. I they apparently Loeb told the psychiatrist that he had done it, and the the psychiatrist not only reported that in court, but they reported it to Darrow, and Darrow later wrote about it in his memoirs. So I mean, I think that's fairly certain. 
Um, and I don't think, in a, in a weird way, that kind of conceit in, in rope, that what they were trying to do in that movie, the idea is that they're both pulling on one end of the rope as they strangle their victim in order to um, share the moral responsibility for the murder. And that is not exactly how they murdered Bobby Franks, but it is something they considered doing. So that whole idea came from the confessions and the interrogations. Um, I really do think they were, whichever one of them wielded the chisel, and I'm pretty sure it was Loeb, but I think they, they were convinced that they did completely share the moral responsibility for it, and they did. So yeah, the mystery that you can, that still is I think that the main mystery, I think that the thing that makes this case so evergreen and so relevant, if you think about what is the first conversation we have after any spectacular murder now or mass killing, um, you know, was it, to, what's the motive? Is the first thing you're going to hear the journalists talking about, what was the motive? Was it, you know, terrorism? What, if it was a school shooting, was, it, was, he, was he bullied? Was it a jealous lover? Like, we really need to know the motive. And I think the eternal mystery in this case, despite all of the confessions and the interrogations and the psychiatrists and, and, and them saying themselves, the motive was we just wanted the thrill, you know? I don't think anybody understands that to be a motive. I think that the motive remains the central mystery in this case because people just cannot wrap their minds around it, why, why they would have done it. And I think the reason they keep writing books and movies and, you know, everyone sort of wants to sort of explore some plausible explanation for what could explain this. But I think n n even though normally people get involved in a case because it's a whodunit, you know, there's some mystery around that. This is a why done it, and to the extent that it's a why done it, it's never been solved. Well, you know, I was thinking this ti the title of the book could have been From Kenwood to Rose Hill. Yes. And very quickly, what will one find in Rose Hill Cemetery, which is a fascinating Civil War cemetery, mm -hmm. and other people uh, from Chicago, it's really an interesting place to be, actually, if yeah. one likes cemeteries. What will one find there relative to this case? Well, Kenwood, of course, is the neighborhood within Hyde Park where all the families lived about a block away from where the Obama house is, just, you know, as an aside. Um, but the families lived um, within a four-block area in Kenwood. After the crime, they all fled the area um, for obvious reasons. But the, the ironic thing is if you go to Rose Hill Cemetery now and you can find the three family plots that are all there and they're, they, their um, proximity to each other almost exactly mimics the proximity of the houses in life. So all three of these families that were so thoroughly just decimated and traumatized and destroyed by what happened are now resting in eternal peace, one hopes, um, just in, at Rose Hill in pretty much the same neighborhood that they lived in, in Kenwood, in life. Fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been wonderful. This is very interesting. And uh, let me just say that Author's Voice, we've come to the end of our time, so you're on Author's Voice, which connects authors to the world. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will see what's coming up with Author's Voice Thursday, Two days, August 16th at 3.30 p.m., a house divided with Bjorn Skaptison uh, will have James Pula returning with his next volume in the series Under the Crescent Moon with the 11th Corps, 1862-63. to 63. This is volume two, From Gettysburg to Victory. So James Pula in two days at 3.30 with Bjorn. Uh, Tuesday, August 28th, we have a doubleheader. At noon... We have our mystery show, Solved, which this could have been on, for heaven's sakes, with Libby Hellman interviewing Mary Kubica with her new book, When the Lights Go Out. And then at 1.30, very soon after, is that true? 1.30, that's only an hour and a half? Wow. Lit with Love with Sonali Dev welcoming Brenda Novak to discuss her latest book, Face Off. So Solved and Lit with Love on August 28th, a Tuesday, I think you're going to enjoy that doubleheader. Now, you can pre-order 
your signed copies of books, of course, at authorsvoice.net. We encourage you to do so. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube after the live broadcast, you can still order signed books of this and any time, any of our books, uh, by going to the link underneath the title. So what can I say? Uh, this is a super book. And Agate Press, is, imprint, is doing this from Midway Press. And this artifact of a book is just a wonderful piece that I think you're all going to enjoy. If you like a good juicy murder, as much as you know about it, and as much as we've just talked about, you're going to find a lot more in here. And I recommend it highly, and we can get a signed book to you. And I can't say it's a good Christmas gift, but it is a good Christmas gift. So you might think about that. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Nina, thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Dave. And, of course, the staff at, at Author's Voice and Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, we thank them because they make this happen. Come and join us again. Thursday is our next time up. Thanks for being with us. Good afternoon. <laughs>